Welcome to Nothing Is Real, a podcast about the Beatles. Everybody thinks they know the Beatles, but how much do we really know? My name's Jason Carty. My name's Stephen Cockcroft. And we're live on tape from Dublin and Belfast. Last week, we looked at the first part of the album Ram. And where we left the story was on a very exciting cliffhanger. It's December 1970. And Paul has finished the bulk of recording the first batch of sessions for Ram. And he has to uh, reach a decision about how he is going to proceed legally against the other three Beatles. And December 1970 is a bit of a hot zone for Beatles activity, isn't it, Stephen? You've got All Things Must Pass out and setting the world on fire with yep. My Sweet Lord. Plastic Ona Band has come out and John is singing I Don't Believe in Beatles and everyone's shocked and stunned. Um, John is giving, you know, he's starting to give those kind of very uh, deep interviews to Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone, yeah. Taking no prisoners at all. Um, Klaus Vormann is being tipped as a potential bass replacist in, uh, in, in, in the Fab Four, which is not unimaginable considering his role in the Plastic Ono Band. Yeah. Um, but Paul is, as we said in part one, he is leading up to taking the legal process to its ultimate conclusion to try and dissolve the partnership between the four Beatles. He's been given an ultimatum by his brother-in-law, John Eastman, um, to say that this is what you have to do. There's been some legal groundwork taking place and all roads lead to the famous date in Beatle history of the 31st of December, 1970. Yes, and this is the day on which the writs are actually served. So although the paperwork has been drawn up in, in preparation for this, this is the day, uh, New Year's Eve. And as, as you know, I, I, I admire any lawyer who can... <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, there isn't any significant... I mean, I, like, from a legal point of view, there's no significance to it being, oh, we have to get it done before the end of the year, is there? There's nothing... No, there's, no, that's not no, the reason. No, and, it's just... And, it's, it's, you know, the, we think, the, we think the, the papers were originally drawn up in November. You have 12 months within which to serve the papers. But, okay. Uh, so there's a combination, I suppose, uh, of... John Eastman basically saying to Paul, this is what you have to do. And Paul deciding, you know, you know, reluctantly coming to the view that, yeah, we have to fire this gun. And then just the the sheer fun and enjoyment for the lawyers of serving (laughs) something on New Year's Eve. I mean, you know, it's not it's not a fun job being a lawyer and you've got to take your amusements where you can. (laughs) But don't you have to serve these writs to the actual people? So was there a notion maybe that, well, they might be all at home on New Year's Eve, I guess. Well, no, you can serve them. Uh, you you can serve them by recorded delivery at at, at addresses, so you don't have to, you know, okay. actually sort of like walk up with a a, a glove and slap someone in the face with the wit. It's, it's, <laughs> although, well, that's, although if, if, I have if, to say, if I've learned anything say, from television, it's that you know I, people throw I, subpoenas at people or whatever. Yeah, I I think that would be much more fun if you had to actually slap somebody in the face with the with the writ. Yeah, um, like legal tag. Yeah, if 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 I'm ever in a position to bring that law in, I will I will certainly do that. But um, so so they serve these papers, and um, essentially it it, and this is why it plays out so badly in the press uh, subsequently because it's a personal attack. It's Paul McCartney suing John Lennon, George Harrison, and Richard Starkey. Um, so it has to be. One Beatle suing the other three. It, it, it's a personal thing. It's not an impersonal corporation. It, it's it's uh, a partnership. And what Paul is looking for is a declaration that the partnership, the, the Beatles partnership, is over, mm-hmm. um, and that that partnership legally ought to be dissolved. And th- th- the reasons put forward are interesting. So he says that Beatles had ceased to perform together as a group. So the purpose of the partnership. Uh, no longer existed. Yeah. Um, and, and what he means there is not that they're performing live, but just they'd cease to, to function or record. Yep. Um, the other big uh, uh, issue is that the other three Beatles had, despite Paul's opposition and in breach of the partnership agreement, appointed Alan Klein and Abco as their business manager, which is really, I suppose... The, the crux of the matter mm. and then you just tag something on at the end to say oh and, and our client has never been given audited accounts during the four years of the partnership to date I, I imagine Paul has never once asked to see mm. the audited accounts um, but again it's a sort of technical breach yes uh, uh, and 
you know, this this kind of date of the 31st of December, it always felt hugely symbolic because mm. this is the ultimate band of the 60s. Yes. And kind of, you know, the 31st of December is kind of like the end of the decade in a way, 1970, before yeah. you kind of roll into the main decade itself. So it would have been a much, it would have felt much less symbolic if it had been, you know, the 22nd of February, 1972. Like, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But this kind of yeah. end of 1970, um, you know, and it's a month of the dream is over uh, yeah. from John. And again, this sets up a paradigm of Paul having split up the Beatles, even though we all know the truth is not quite as clear as that. He, but he, he certainly legally is the man who split up the Beatles. Yes. Uh, and this is something that will just absolutely haunt him for the next sort of 10 years, I suppose. Um you know, it, it affects everything. It affects uh, his, his sort of PR, his, the way he's treated by the, the music press, particularly the kind of inverted commas hip music press like Rolling Stone. You know, everybody takes a side here. Yes. Uh, and Rolling Stone are very much on John's side. Well, it, but it's that kind of vibe of, you know, uh, Paul is getting labelled with this uh, tag of being, you know, a square. Yeah. And, you know, only squares get the lawyers involved because the lawyers are the man. And what we now know with the benefit of hindsight, and Paul has talked about this, is that the decision to serve those writs on the 31st of December directly influences how the Beatles exist today. And the fact that we have our nice Abbey Road 50th anniversary box set oh, is yes. because of what happened on the 31st of December 1970. Yes, Paul's very keen to take credit for that. Well, he does He does do that thing where he takes credit for it. And, you know, he also does that lovely backwards compliment. You know, and even George said, you know, thanks, man, you did it for us. And, and <laughs> there's, there's a bit of that that goes on in later years, which must the, have just made their teeth water. There, in, there, 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 there is. I mean, uh, it, you know, in, in one sense... You know, I have a lot of sympathy for him. He's uh, he he makes the point uh, at the time. Uh, you know, he he'd been in the Beatles since he was a teenager. These were his best friends, and then suddenly he has to sue them. Um, I think if he could simply have walked away without doing this, he'd have been quite happy to do that. But they are just absolutely tied up in knots uh, in terms of these legal agreements. It's not just their their contracts with DMI. It's the publishing everything. Yeah, uh, you know they're absolutely uh, linked forever in a day. Um, yeah, well, Paul talks about that about this in the book many years from now, and as we said, the perception might have been, oh, it's Square Paul getting the lawyers in, but he says, you know, very pointedly, you know, we we the, the process rescued the Beatles' millions, which had taken us long enough to earn. I always thought, I think this is a very interesting quote. I always thought it was very clean money compared to shipbuilders and the great sugar fortunes. No one had to buy our records, but we kept people in work in the vinyl factories. We worked for this and we felt good about, you know, hanging on to our money. And, you know, the flip side of Paul's a square and the lawyers in is that Paul is making a judgment call to yeah. say what's fair and right to the creators of this music. Now, the flip side of that argument is I think sometimes people think, well, Alan Klein was involved and we look at Rolling Stone records now and they have Abco on them up until 1971 and we can't mm. get Rolling Stone's box sets. But at the same time, Klein was just contracted. Klein's time was going to run out if you just yeah. watch the clock for a few more years anyway. He didn't really have a right to put his name on the Beatles material, but Klein worked in mysterious ways. It's not impossible to imagine he might have made a land grab at some point. Yes, I think I, I think that's right. I, I mean, yeah, you know, uh, we, you know, we might do an episode or five on Klein at some Absolutely. point. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, playing devil's advocate, uh, I, I would say, well, you know, was Klein that bad for the band in terms of what he did? Um, he made them a lot of money. There was a vast uh, uh, leap in their royalty rate. Um, he set out to make money because if they made money he made money and yeah. his his 20 percent that he was getting was only on the increased royalties it was only it wasn't a gross uh, you figure. Know, it, it was yeah um the the difficulty and what the the receiver uh, said at some point was th the problem was klein was taking his 20 percent off the top you know off the top line mm -hmm. um so if they may, you know, if the Beatles make 10 million pounds, then you have to deduct from that all the expenses and then you get the net profit. Klein's contract gave him 20% of the gross, not 20% of the net. And, and that was the sort of discrepancy. Um, and to be fair to Paul, the receiver ultimately does conclude and has said 
uh, you know, if things had gone on the way, uh, undoubtedly they 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 would have lost all their money. Undoubtedly, Klein, mm. because he was taking it, he was taking it before tax, before expenses. He was getting the lion's share, or was potentially getting the lion's share. But as you say, yeah, by nineteen seventy three, seventy four, it was all over, and Klein was out. Yeah. But in in the meantime, uh, I mean, the one big thing that Klein did for everybody was release the red album and the blue album. Mm. And which is arguably the foundation stone on which everything rests today. So is, do we have Paul to thank for that? Arguably. How long do we have to argue about that? Uh, well, <laughs> it, it, you know, I put it to you that, um, you know, yeah, Paul, Paul, you, you, you said, you know, uh, the foundations of what we get today, it's oh, all down, no, no, all down that, to Paul. True, yeah. and I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking, well, you know, yeah. arguably it's the red and the blue album that just kept that legacy alive. There was no, there was no... Uh, precedent for yeah, it's certainly a defunct, the most, yeah, you know yeah. a defunct group keeping going yes and it certainly is the most significant Beatles statement of the 70s yeah. uh, ex- uh, post split existence that's still that's still around today but it was really very very different to be a Beatles fan at the end of 69 uh, versus the start of 71 um you know across 1970 you know John had started in the top 10 with life peace in Toronto he'd ended it uh, with being the top 10 with John Lennon plastic Ono band you know, McCartney had been number one. Ringo's Sentimental Journey had sold half a million in 1970. But obviously by the end of 1970, when those writs are being served on the 31st of December, the, the man of the moment is All Things Must Pass, where George is riding the wave of what I would call solemn 1970s pop <laughs> of, of Let It Be and Bridge Over Troubled Waters. And big, important, uh, big, important spiritual statement. Oh, Absolutely. And uh, he is uh, the man of the moment. So um, he must have really enjoyed getting that writ on the 31st of December. But the overview that, you know, we try and get people to recognize here is that this happens in the middle of recording uh, Ram. And arguably, it, it, it does seem to have an effect on Paul. So, you know, we talked in the first part about all the music he got recorded over a month in New York yeah. um, with the, the, the session guys. And, you know, they're, they're raw tracks. They need overdubs. There's still a few more uh, tracks to be recorded. But as the year progresses and as Paul ends up having to plug himself into what's happening in the UK courts, uh, his focus might change a little bit. Um, but we're back in January. And on the 2nd of January, Paul and Linda are filmed in Scotland um, uh, on their farm using footage uh, where they're singing, you know, for, for three legs and heart of the country. This gets used on top of the pops later in 1971. And then on the 3rd of January, uh, Paul and Linda and the family head back to uh, New York City. Uh, the legal wheels are turning. Also, Paul's lawyers are buying him land. Isn't that right? Yes, on the 9th of January, he buys Scotland. He buys all of Scotland. All well, he, of Scotland. <laughs> he buys 400 acres attached to his farm. Yes. What what What's happening? With, people know where he is now. You know, the yes. fans. This is the other difference between 69 and, and early 1970 when he can disappear. The fans know where he is. They know where this uh, cottage is. So increasingly, they just turn up um, uh, and sort of beat a path to his door. And... Um, you know, there are various stories come out at this time about, you know, one particular girl camps out uh, and kind of spies on them every day with binoculars. Um, so what Paul does eventually sort of this is being the start of it. He starts buying up Parcels all the land, land around yeah. so that you cannot actually see his cottage without straying onto his land. And then he can kind of keep uh, keep people at bay. So this is this is this is uh, Again, people are intruding on his sanctuary, but uh, yeah, he buys 400 acres and this is just the start. So in January 1971, we don't think he's doing any direct recording for Ram straight away. And actually, he ends up flying back to London on the 18th of February. And throughout the whole court case, because that comes to the courts pretty quickly in in mid-February, is... Paul is very attentive to what's going on and he turns up. The other three do not turn up, no. but Paul does turn up. And what we know in retrospect is that seems to have uh, an impact on the judge because he is seen as a serious and earnest and organized person yeah. in a way to the court. 
yes, the, 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 the basic rule, and I, I, I can give this piece of free uh, legal advice. Legal is, advice is um, not binding. The, the, <laughs> the, the, ba the, basic, the basic rule in litigation is whoever appears to be the most reasonable wins. <laughs> um, don't let any other, don't, let, don't, don't get distracted by tricky legal arguments. But, <laughs> but yes, a huge, it, in this type of, of litigation, where Paul is basically saying, I am the reasonable, sensible one, uh, you know, the other three are... Uh, fallen under the spell of Alan Klein. I mean, look at all those crazy things John Lennon and Yoko Ono are doing. And you know, you know, you know, it's yep. about turning up. It's about looking the part. Um, so yeah, he turns up uh, on the nineteenth of uh, February in his Abbey Road Tommy Nutter suit, and he's regrown his nice uh, let it be beard. So there are these great photographs of him in his kind of coat and suit and stri yeah. open neck white shirt striding into the, the the court. And it was his legal team said, you've, you've got to be there. And from what we know that uh, John, George and Ringo do have a meeting together. Uh, they, yep. they don't attend court together uh, because then we might have had all four Beatles in the room. That would have been something. But there'd been a punch up. <laughs> or there could have been a some other kind of denouement. But, yeah. you know, what's really real is that John, George and Ringo are together and they kind yes. of have to be together for legal purposes, but they actually are meeting themselves individually. Um, and man, to have been a fly on the wall when John, George and Ringo are in a room talking about that's, all. That's, wow. what, that's when you want those tips tips running. Oh, I, I can't imagine how they were processing all of that. Well, we have a little bit of knowledge. And the number one song at the time is My Sweet Lord. Yeah. So again, you can't imagine jo John <laughs> is happy about that, you know. Um, maybe, I'm, <laughs> yes. maybe I'm just projecting there. But you kind of think suddenly George has come, uh, you know, out of the traps. His album is just selling by the lorry load yeah. uh, in the US and the UK. Um, John's album has done reasonably well, but it's nothing like uh, 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 All Things Must Pass. And the other interesting thing that happens on the 19th is Another Day is released as a single in yeah. the UK. Paul. So it's like Paul, Paul uh, court case, Paul McCartney, and, uh, you know, oh, and he's got a single out. So never want to waste a, a well, yeah, it's a wonder he didn't. An opportunity. He wasn't wearing another day as a badge or something as he walked into courts, just to get the word out there that he had a yeah. single. He's in uh, London. Uh, he will return to London in a few days' time, but he's there for just that one day in the court. He travels back uh, on uh, the evening of the 19th to, to New York City and actually goes straight back to recording the title track of Ram. Pretty much. So on, on the 22nd, uh, he's in the studio recording Ram on. And the or Ramon Ramon. Well, that's the legend of the song yeah. is that, uh, um, you know, uh, so Paul had initially changed his name back in 1960 to Paul Ramon, which was uh, when, when all the Beatles were trying on different pseudonyms and it seemed French and exotic to, to Paul. Sexy at the bass time. player. And the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so, yeah, it was a. Uh, um, Carl Harrison was George and Long John was, was uh, uh, John Lennon. Um, my, my, my favorite is Stuart de Staal. Yes. By, uh, Stuart Sutcliffe. You know, Sutcliffe de Staal. That's, you yeah. know. But, you know, you, can, you, 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 need to, you need to just remind yourself sometimes about how they, knowledgeable yeah. and pretentious the uh, pre fame Beatles were. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and how serious they were. Um, but Paul's calling himself uh, Paul Ramon. And, yeah, it seems, I don't know why that might have been playing in his brain, but it's obviously, he, he, he has said in interviews that that's where Ramon comes from in the, in, the, in the song, just playing with those words in his head. Don't know why. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I, it, it seems to be one of those things that he made up in the studio. And again, the uh, Dixon Van Winkle, I never tire of saying Dixon Van Winkle. <laughs> um, he said, uh, one day Paul was standing around strumming on a ukulele, rocking from side to side, singing Ramon. I just ran out, put a mic on the ukulele clearly one on his face and a pair of mics down by his feet the tapping you hear comes from the mics on his feet so it seems to have been a a sort of a spontaneous uh a little kind of ditty um it's much longer mm -hmm. than the version that we that we hear um you know there's like two versions on the yes, album we've got the it, reprise. It's, it's, a, it's a much longer piece and it sounds spontaneous because you hear a little bit of speaking you hear a little kind of piano flourish as if it's just kind of you know tap tap is it rolling but actually all of that is flown in from another session yes. so the little piano glissando and the dialogue it's all stitched together to make it appear uh 
spontaneous or more uh, spontaneous than it was. Yeah, it, uh, yes, and it, it appears to have just been a yeah a written song, written and of course played on a on a ukulele because he used to carry one around with him. Who who was playing a ukulele in 1971? Uh, Tiny Tim was. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's it's, about it. It's, yeah, it's weird. It's not. It's not. It's not a rock instrument. It's uh, not. Is it just convenience? I mean, do we have this song to blame for the? Horrific number of 21st century sincere <laughs> doe-eyed singer-songwriters strumming you, a ukulele and possibly and bayfully singing I don't know a Britney Spears song in some sort of arch postmodern ironic fashion. I, I'd hate to think that that's all Paul's fault. No, you don't want to blame him for that. But it it it, it again it's it's. It's just, it's a portable instrument. He can yeah. carry it around in the back of a taxi. Um, you know, as you say, Tiny Tim, that's a kind of joke. I think it's mm. not a serious musical instrument at the time, but but Paul, and not only that, it's front and centre. It's the, it's the title track. Yeah, and, it, and it, it sounds great. And obviously, you know, we know as the years go by, uh, George Harrison was a great man for the old ukuleles. Yep. That, uh, I can't remember if it's a ukulele or a mandolin that gets strummed on Dance Tonight, but it's another one of these kind of yeah, portable four-stringed kind of little, uh, yeah. uh, uh, instruments. And uh, the interesting thing about Ramon uh, is this little snippet of Big Barn Bed that we get. Yes. So again, you just have a sense. It's it's a lyric that's popped into his head or a melody and he just he sings it. And yeah. uh, then uh, it's almost an insight into the songwriting process. So he's just jamming around. He comes up with that lyric. And then obviously that just lodges and you think, OK, that that could be a song. We could we could take that. And he comes up with uh, Big Barn Bad. So it's a complete re-recording. Uh, it's it's uh, yeah, because he doesn't it, for all the songs he records at this time. Big Barn Bed is not on the list of what he's recording. No, so that yeah. that's that's a song that comes later, but using this fragment uh, of lyric, and he he has played Ramon occasionally. Yeah, uh, he has, yeah, two thousand two two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve, and I think when Robin Hitchcock was on the show, because Robin Hitchcock's been on the show, friend of the show. Um, uh, I think he mentioned uh, Paul. He went to the sound check. Oh uh, yes, yeah. When he 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 and I went to to. Two, two gigs, not together, obviously. Um, but he got to go to the sign check and uh, he played Ramon there as a sign check song. It's, uh, yeah, it's a great little song. And, um, you know, it also gave us the Ramones because yes. they were looking uh, for a name and they remembered the Paul Ramon story and they called themselves the Ramones. <laughs> <That's>, so <laughs> That seems so unlikely. But it's, well, it, they, they took their pop music seriously. But who knew that, you know, when... Uh, you know, he was calling himself Paul Ramon for that tour in 1960. We'd get uh, the brothers doing their thing yeah. uh, two decades later. Um, so that's Ramon, and our, uh, that gives us the, uh, the the title of the album. There's some more songs uh, that get recorded about this time, but of course the wheels of justice are running because on the day that Ramon is getting... Uh, um, recorded back in London is also there's affidavits being read out in court. So Klein's yes. affidavit is read out in court on the 22nd and he's painting himself understandably as the hero of the hour. Why would you want to sue Alan Klein? Lovely Alan Klein. Lovely yeah. cuddly, cuddly Alan Klein. Yeah, th this, is, this is what is so sort of, uh, I was going to say bizarre, but it's kind of slightly thrilling that while, while Paul is strumming a ukulele in a New York <laughs> studio, um, uh, so Klein doesn't actually get in the witness box and none of the other three Beatles get in the witness box. But but, but essentially, each of them has, has provided an affidavit, which is just a sworn statement that then is, is, is read out in court. So he, uh, Klein's uh, affidavit is basically saying, I came in to rescue the band from a dreadful situation that when I arrived, you know, their finances were in a mess. Um, they, they were directionless and they needed me to sort it out. And he also... Uh, Again, it, it, highlighting Paul, he's saying everybody except Paul regarded individual earnings as a group asset. So all those millions and millions of sales of Two Virgins and Life with the Lions, <laughs> all of that money is just going into a central pot. And he's sort of saying, well, now Paul is the only one that is basically saying, well, what's mine is mine uh, and I'm not going to share. And, well, the and flip Klein, side of that is, though, that you're also responsible for a quarter of the liabilities of yes, the non stuff. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. But Klein points out, you know, my sweet lord is number one, it's going to earn a million pounds and Paul is going to get a quarter of that, you know, less, mm. expense, less expenses, which include Klein's 20% off the top. <laughs> but, um, you know, so it is, if I were sort of on Paul's uh, legal 
team that day may come um, <laughs> I, I would be thinking yes that's a, that's a very good point that you're making because this shows that Paul is not doing this for the money you, you know it is about artistic freedom it is about he, he, he could just sit back and not record anything and he could have a quarter of the profits of My Sweet Lord a quarter of the profit well obviously less George's plagiarism so um, but uh, it's boom time for lawyers but uh, you know he could just sit back and take a quarter of the Apple income so I actually I, you would be able to spin that as well my client is above money yes yeah I suppose you could but I, I guess in the years since many bands have learned to be legally dysfunctional and stay together you know and take take yeah. take the hit yeah yeah, but yeah. We're, we're in uncharted territories uh, here Um that's yeah, that's the 22nd of February, 23rd of February. There's affidavits from John, George and Ringo that are read out while, you know, Paul is over in New York recording the great cock and seagull race. And I hear the song of mine. He, I, that, that, that's kind of the artistic equivalent of sticking your fingers in your ears going la la la. Yeah, I think, it, I, I think so. And again, we, you know, we're kind of playing amateur psychologist, but why not? You, you, you've got to assume that Paul's legal team are keeping him informed about what's happening so that they're on the phone that evening saying you'll never believe what klein said it is affidavit and uh then the next day paul goes in and he records great cock and seagull bits <laughs> classic yes. and and a little kind of ditty called now hear this song of mine which uh, I, and you think so the next day after the sort of affidavits are coming and while that's happening as you say um the, the, the good stuff is happening, the affidavits from John, George and Ringo. No better man in a crisis to hit the studio. Like he did that in December 1980. Yeah. He did it during yeah. rockdown. Uh, it's, it's, it's obviously his happy place. But uh, Yes, you do get a, you, you get a real sense, particularly in the sort of November period, uh, that October, November period, that while uh, sort of, you know, all sorts of stuff is hitting the fan back in London, the studio is his safe space yeah and he can go in there and he can kind of forget about it and he can put it out of his mind uh but now it's different there are actually lawyers involved as affidavits being read out and, mm. and on that day the 23rd uh john's affidavit is is read out and um john's affidavit is really fascinating because he uh he, he is really kind of coming into bat for Klein and he's saying, you know, Apple is full of hustlers and spongers uh, before Klein got there. And mm. you think the people here are describing that's Pete Chotten. That's that's uh, Neil. Derek, Derek Taylor. That's Neil Aspinall. That's Mal Evans. He's he's absolutely uh, throwing these guys under the bus. Yeah. Um, in terms of the artistic uh issues he's saying well you know uh, there are lots of uh, artistic and musical differences and it's mostly uh, uh george and paul uh mm -hmm. falling out and the argument said you know it's 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 them and Klein's coming in to save us from the spongers and uh you know we can work out all these other things and uh, again what what you've got to remember is the focus of the affidavits that we're going to hear are klein is the man to save us financially, but also artistically, the Beatles are still viable. Mm. Uh, they are still capable of producing music and they are still together. So the other three have to, as their key legal argument, say the Beatles are still a valid legal entity. Right. Um, and we also get uh, affidavits from George and Ringo on the same day. George, he... In his affidavit, he refers to this, the, the thing we've talked about before, the 68 visit to the US where he's hanging out at Woodstock with the band. Yes. Uh, and, you know, what a what a functional group of people they turned out to be. They turned out to be. But George wasn't to know that. Uh, these these affidavits, I think, are fascinating because yeah. they they just give you so much insight into the the personalities of, of the other three. So John has been this very aggressive, sarcastic, everybody's a sponsor, everybody's a... George's affidavit focuses on the fact, you know, I went to, uh, you know, Woodstock, hung out with Bob Dylan and the band, and they all got on great, and all this camaraderie, and uh, the, there was a respect there that I never got from Paul uh, in, in my own group. He gives details uh, of that walkout in January 69. But he mm. then goes on to specifically say, and everything improved after that. Um, 
So there's precedent for us working through our differences. Yeah, we work through our differences. And actually, Paul, uh, there's no reason why we can't work things out. And his attitude improved. And clearly, there's a hint of playing to the press gallery here in particular. Um, But you think this is probably the first first hand acknowledgement that George had left the band at some point. Mm. And then Ringo has an affidavit too, and he references the George and Paul meeting that we mentioned in the last episode in December that yes. something bad happened. Again, not very specific about what that was. George, <laughs> Ringo gives good affidavit. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, he, he says, uh, you know, uh, I was shocked and dismayed after Mr. McCartney's promise about a meeting in January that a writ should have been issued. By Mr. McCartney, you know it's it's. Uh, He's clutching do, his pearls. As, do, you, do you think Do you think Ringo has ever said shocked and uh, yeah, dismayed? Yeah, dismayed. That's, that's no. classic legal speak. So yeah, he he is sort of saying, well, something must have happened that I'm not aware of, uh, and he he references that 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 meeting that we'd all like to know what happened at that meeting. Um, so skip forward a few days, and you know Paul in the throes of making Ram flies back to London, and Paul on the sixth day of the hearing on the twenty sixth of February turns up in the High Court again to give his own testimony and his own side of the story. And again, as we said a few minutes ago, this is powerful. He's the guy who's turning up yep. to talk about this directly. And he gives a couple of uh, points that he wants to talk about. My favorite one is that he says, have you heard that song? I don't believe in Beatles. Huh? Have you yeah. heard that? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. oh, John, why did you say that? <laughs> exactly. Oh, it was all going so well. <laughs> exactly. So, 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 uh, yeah, they can say this is the point. He, uh, his argument is we're finished. The other guys are saying, no, we're, we're fine. And Lennon has a song, I don't believe in Beatles. You think they should just have stopped the trial right there. <laughs> yes. Um, it, it, Lennon letting himself down by everything that he is saying and doing. <laughs> and, and, it's, and again, it's interesting that Paul turns up. The other three aren't there giving evidence. They yeah. send in affidavits. But again, Paul has been told by his legal team, you turn up, you get in the witness box, you give your evidence, you know, look the judge yeah. straight in the eye and you are the reasonable person here. And he talks also in his testimony that, you know, up until Klein arrived, everything had been unanimous. And then Klein is the first time it's not unanimous. And that's yeah. obviously something that really rankles with him. And even, you know, history sort of says he wants the Eastman, but he says in this testimony, well, once they didn't want the Eastmans, I didn't push it. I, I withdrew the suggestion. Um, you know, whether that's true or not, or playing to the gallery a little bit, we're not sure. Yeah, so obviously he I, keeps I, the Eastmans I, on for himself. He would have uh, been happy uh, if they'd said yes to the Eastmans. I, yes, I think so. I think so. Um, but the, my favourite piece of the whole uh, uh, sort of evidence that he gives is he said uh, he, he reports a phone call that he had uh, with Klein, in which Klein said, you know why John is angry with you? It's because you come off better than he did and let it be. The real trouble is Yoko. She is the one with the ambition. So this is Klein saying this to Paul. Paul. And, and then Paul, you know, peeping coyly from beneath his <laughs> floppy hair. <laughs> his big says, Paul eyes. Yeah. I often wonder what John would have said if he had heard that remark. And you think, well, he's heard it now. He certainly uh, you has. Think, uh, <laughs> you think there is, it's a, is that sort of the equivalent of a subtweet? Is that, uh, that, that that's <laughs> a, <laughs> you know? Oh my God, if Twitter had been around back then, it would have been crazy. Yeah. Um, so Paul steps out of the witness box and on the 1st of March, Paul and Linda go back to New York City and then they travel on to LA. And this is the, the kind of the third and final tranche of work yeah. on RAM or the LA sessions. And, and here's, Here's the, the the thing that you notice when you look at all of these component parts is that um, there's this legend in the past that says, you know, Paul went off to Scotland in late 69 and was depressed and didn't know what was going on. And we have said before, that was only a couple of weeks. How could he have yeah. gotten through all of that? What you kind of notice is that Paul sort of, maybe it's a bit dramatic to say he goes off the rails, but certainly his productivity and his approach to work changes at this point on that his yes. his his the first half of his 71 is very different to the the latter end of his 1970 when he's churning out these 20 plus odd songs in New York that is his productivity rate changes and he's off in LA and i kind of think when you look at this timeline of events you know the 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 split up of the beatles has now become very real very legal and he kind of loses focus which is not like him once he gets yep. off to LA in terms of trying to get the final ram over the line. I I, I think that's absolutely right. And I, I, I think what happens is the, the New York studio 
is a refuge. You know, he's having a fun time. He he's hanging out with people that he likes. He clearly has a fantastic relationship with Denny Sywell. Um, they're making music. They're working through all these songs he has, and he's having a fun time. And he, he it's it's almost like displacement activity. He can um, forget about what's happening in the background because it's slightly unreal mm. it's happening a continent away he's not directly involved but then suddenly he has to make a decision at christmas and suddenly it is real and he's in a, in court he's standing in the witness box he's having to, it all becomes extremely real and unfortunately that also coincides with you know the end of the new york sessions so mm. then he's faced with the next stage of, of of getting an album out which is uh you know completing the tracks making the song selection uh deciding when it's going to come out and and all of those practical things he's no longer just in a studio having fun and the 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 one new song that gets put down when he you know for those first two weeks in march when he's in la is uh, is dear boy yeah um which you know was it about the beatles john thought so but it obviously isn't paul has said no. very explicitly no. i mean paul would say it was if it wasn't but paul said it's yeah. about linda's first husband that's right. I mean, I, I I must admit the first time that I heard heard the song, I assumed it was about, you know, dear boy, I guess you never knew just yes. what you had. And, and again, you think it's exactly the same. You took your lucky break and broke it into it. You think, well, it taps into that. It must be about the Beatles. But yeah, he's he's very explicit. And there's no reason now for, for him not to say, oh, yeah, it was about the Beatles, if it was about the Beatles. But he's very explicit. Um, so in, in Mojo in 2001, he said uh, it was actually a song to Linda's ex-husband. I guess you never knew what you had missed. And then he says, I never told him that, which was lucky because he's since committed suicide. Oh, that's and you think, bleak. Well, yeah, wow, okay, phew. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is that Joseph, was lucky. Joseph Melville C. Jr. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very odd type of love song i don't know yeah but he said he he does say this at the time he said uh it's autobiography autobiography it's myself how lucky i was to have linda um but again it's you're back to that slightly oblique it's not it's not a long-haired lady type song there is a a, a kind of uh obfuscation to it it could be could be about anything Okay. And uh, we also think that maybe Dear Friend was recorded in and around that time. Yes, there seems to be some doubt about that. So in that Luca Parisi book, he says, you know, it could have been March, could have been August, could have been New York, could have been LA. Um, uh, Everyone, you know, uh, says, yeah, it came out of the Ram sessions, but no one seems exactly sure. Uh, when and that might be a reflection of the fact that you know there seem to be pretty good notes around the New York sessions, perhaps less so around the LA sessions. And so, who, uh, for, who one, come, for one reason or another. And so, who comes in uh, in LA? Because this is where uh, Jim Gersio, am I saying that right? Uh, yep. Who's kind of known for his work with Blood, Sweat, and Tears in Chicago? He gets drafted in, and we kind of get a bit of an insight from him about Paul's state of mind. Yes. So what what seems to have happened is certainly in the the hard signs book. He he says you know Paul was losing focus. Uh, you know, in contrast to the nine a.m. six p.m. work ethic in New York, there was a bit of uh, what should we say dynamite weed. I think uh, it's a dynamite weed issue potentially. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, and Paul was just sort of on it. You know, he's got twenty plus songs. He can't really decide. And again, it's the brother in law. It's John Eastman introduces him to Jim Garrico. Um, who actually was so keen uh, to, to work with Paul that he cancelled his honeymoon um, <laughs> to work on the Dear Boy track. Um, and, and he talks about the pressure that Paul is under to, uh, you know, improve on the critical uh, uh, drubbing that McCartney got. Um, and uh, But he says, you, you, you know, uh, after weeks, uh, Garrico, basically, Garrico gave Paul a, track listing and said, uh, you know, I have to go. I'm going on honeymoon. The engineers can do it. And he says, I think Paul took offense. Um, and he said, Paul is not an artist you can direct or collaborate with. You kind of have to support his ideas. Yeah. So I think he find it less than less than satisfactory. Um, but it's this idea that his brother-in-law lawyer is having to kind of step in and say, here's a guy that could help you get this over the line. Yes. Um, and then on the 12th of March, at the right at the end of the recording of the album, the High Court rules in Paul's favour. 
And the other three Beatles are found guilty and thrown in jail. Hooray. They are. No. Hooray. No, 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 no. no, no. Uh, the other three Beatles uh, leave the court, get in a Rolls Royce, <laughs> drive round to Paul's house. John climbs over the wall and throws not one, but two bricks through Paul's window, supposedly. <laughs> um, and then, which is, you know, that's that's standard legal procedure. And I mean, well, then, <laughs> but it's nice to they, think that uh, uh, John, George and Ringo are still doing stuff together, yes, I guess. They're, they're still collaborating. their last act. Uh, <laughs> their last creative the last act. creative act as Beatles is to uh, uh, throw a brick through the Paul's window. Brick. But but then interestingly, they then drive back to uh, Savile Row, mm. where there's a scrum of of journalists, and then they have another kind of meeting. You know, because they've got to decide what are we going to do? Are we going to just accept this? Are we going to appeal? Uh, what are the pros and cons? Um, so that's that's still the, the legal wheels. You know, those lawyers. I've got to get paid. Um, uh, but yeah, Paul Paul has won, essentially. Paul has won. So a lot of pressure for him to be under as he's trying to bring this uh, this album in over the line. He, he sounds like someone who needs a break, but that's what we need. So we're going to take one right now and we'll talk to you after this. End of part one, intermission. End of intermission, part two. Welcome back. So... Ram is getting over the line. And then on April the 26th, 1971, Paul gets some good news, really. Yes, the other three have decided not to appeal. Which is unusual in a way, really. Yeah, I mean, effectively what's happening here is now a receiver has been appointed, uh, Mr. Spooner, uh, who will basically run the business um, and check through all the accounts, make sure everything is above board with a view to winding up the partnership. So this is the point at which there's a sort of inevitability to, um, uh, you know, the partnership will end. Um, and this guy's in there to sort that out. And as we know from previous episodes, that eventually happens uh, hmm. at the very back end of 1974. Um, and so Ram is slated to come out on May the 14th. We, we know that Paul and Linda got to work on the cover themselves. Yes, with some felt tip pens. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, it, again, it's it's this kind of very naive uh, looking cover. It's a photograph, and then you can see it's just felt tip pants uh, um, shaded in. And uh, uh, on the inside, again, it it harks back a little bit to the McCartney album, where you've got a collage of photographs. Although here, it's a much more kind of rough and ready, sliced up with scissors and and, and, and coloured. Uh, Coloured in, yeah. and uh, then do you want to talk about the back? Uh, well, the there's back cover. There are two uh, insects, and we'd have to say they are two beetles, and they are copulating. Yes, is that about it. the beetles? I think is that about the beetles? <laughs> Paul said. Paul says no, oh, he never occurred to him. Yeah, I am sure. I am Seriously, sure. Seriously, he has said, oh, it was just kind of two insects. It was a nice photograph. And we thought, so that's the one thing he's not prepared to uh, to cop to. Um, and you see Lily on the front cover? Yes, that's a code. Yes. Linda, I love you. Oh, uh, yes. But, uh, you know, it is, you know, the first album, McCartney, does have a sort of a ramshackle homemade charm about it. Um, the cover of Ram, as we said, kind of it belies the fact that it's a studio concoction it, from the it, east and west coast of America. It's even more ramshackle, the cover. The McCartney yeah. cover, I think, is a beautiful thing. Yeah. And it's kind of gorgeous photographs and it, 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 it's beautifully done. Ram is very much uh, kind of cut and paste. Yeah, the cover of uh, Ram feels like it represents the music on McCartney more. Yes, it does. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and uh, there's also, but the album comes out on May the uh, 14th. But that week, there's a bit of a denouement between Paul and Ringo, isn't there? They've got somewhere to go. Yes, yes. So uh, again, we talked on this before, but on May the 12th, um, so there's a story in, in one of the biographies with Paul and Linda in Scotland and they bump into a local and they're just kind of shooting the breeze and uh, the local says, oh, you know, you're off somewhere. And Paul goes, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to a wedding. And this guy says, oh, you know, great, have a, have a good time. And he said, I just assumed they were going to somewhere locally. But when I turned on the TV that night, they were in Saint-Tropez. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, this was a private jet uh, chartered uh, to take guests to Mick, and Mick Jagger and Bianca's uh, wedding. Um, and Ringo and Maureen are We're there as well. on the plane. And you think, is this the first time they've met since the brick through the window incident? It must be. It, it must you know, be. you think it must. It absolutely must be. Um, 
George is not at the wedding, but uh, Ringo will stay on with Maureen in Saint Tropez, and uh, George flies out to meet Maureen and Ringo, um, and uh, uh, Cilla Black, and they all go off on a boat and uh, write photograph. You know, all roads lead to Cilla Black, don't all they? All roads lead to Cilla Black. I heard a great version the other day. Well, I say a great version, a version uh, of photograph by, by Cilla Black. I'm going to put a link uh, <laughs> to everywhere uh, for that song. Unless you, you pay a ransom. Unless you send money to... Uh... <laughs> um, so the, the singles, as we said, though, you know, the single, the album was preceded in February by, as we said, the Another Day single. And uh, for the album itself comes out in May. The singles that come from the album come out after the album. So, and it's it's different yeah. around the world. So, it's Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey comes out on the second of August uh, in the US. The and as we said, that gets to number one. The backseat of my car is the single chosen for the UK that comes out on the thirteenth of August seventy one. That doesn't enter the top thirty. I think Uncle Albert should have been the single all around the world. To be honest, uh, and then Eat at Home is a Europe only single, uh, which we mentioned earlier that gets to number fifteen in. Italy, an unusual uh, selection of singles. It is. And you're the other unusual thing, two unusual things. One, all those songs are pulled off the album mm-hmm. rather than, you know, precede the album. Yep. And they, they come out in August and September. The album yes. is released in May. And we so don't, why? That's a kind of weird, uh, weird marketing ploy. Absolutely, which yeah. Clearly, 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 clearly doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work in the UK. But it's again to do with the speed of these things. I mean, you know, the album is finished at the end of March and six weeks later, it's it's in the shops. Um, yeah. You know, they're working, they're working very fast. And, you know, who is, who kind of is managing McCartney at this point? Nobody is, you know, he's Nobody. getting managed from a legal point of view, but he's not getting career managed from somebody to no. say, okay, let's listen to the album. Let's pull the single. Let's do this. You know, we'll put you on such a show. He's He's still not doing, apart from, recording some films on his farm. He's not doing any directed promo yet. We're still in the pre-Wings era where he doesn't yeah. have a vehicle to appear places. His only guide is the dynamite weed. Dynamite weed. But that's why there seems to be this, you know, after a very strong period of working, he he, he, he sort of dissolves in the summer of 1971. You know, he doesn't really have a, a huge presence. Yes. Uh, he's, he's, he's got to decide now... Um, what am I going to do? What what mm. what what comes next? I mean, so so you know, let's not forget this is a, an extremely uh, successful album. It gets a number one in the UK, gets a number two in the US. He's got a number one hit single in the US. The singles in, in the UK, I say that's the first song by a Beatle collectively yep. or solo not to get into the top thirty. You know, uh, that might be because Ringo did not release Bukus of Blues in the mm. UK, but. Um, Again, he's got to decide what to do. So then he he picks up the phone to Danny Sywell and Hugh McCracken and, and says, uh, you know, why don't you come over for a holiday? Um, yes. And this is the the, the origins of uh, Wings. Wings. So he's he's thinking, right, a band. I get on really well with with these people. Uh, I'm going to form a band. And of course, the other big life event that's happening is. You know, he finds out, obviously, at some point in the first part of 71 that Linda is pregnant yeah. and Stella McCartney is born on the 13th of September, 71. So the summer is obviously spent prepping for those things. He's got he's got, uh, you know, he's post court case. He's got his album out. He's got other things to maybe keep him distracted. Yeah. And, out of the public and, eye. and it's been a big commercial success, but the reviews are scathing. It is crazy that. You know, we all love Ram now, as we said at the start of all of this. You know, it's number one in the UK, gets number two in the US. It's driven in the US by this number one single. He's he's on the airways. You know, this this notion of, oh, Paul was totally unsuccessful until Band on the Run came out. He was, you know, that's just not true. Yeah, it's a platinum no. album. But as you said, the contemporaneous reviews are, by and large, shocking. Terrible, yeah. absolutely terrible. And I, again, what we, we talked about last week is this idea that um, uh, everyone in the music press had to pick a side. Uh, Rolling Stone picked John Lennon, had, yeah. had, had be, basically been in Camp Lennon since, since uh, its very first uh, issue. Um, John Landau in Rolling Stone says this album is incredibly inconsequential, monumentally irrelevant. Um, and I remember reading 
about this album before I ever heard it in the NME Encyclopedia yeah. of Rock. And what I remember is it is described in Rolling Stone as the nadir <laughs> of the uh, disintegration of 1960s rock. So I came to this album thinking this is the worst album yeah. ever made. Um, and it really took me a while to to get into it. Uh, you know, the, 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 the big peaks, the... Uncle Albert, the backseat of my car, those really stand out. Monkberry Moon Delight was always a song I liked. But yeah, you you get a bit, you, you know, I approach this, I approach wildlife, you're predisposed because the fact that these uh, reviews, the NME said an excursion into almost unrelieved tedium, <laughs> the worst thing that Paul McCartney has ever done. So, you know. Pick a side, guys. Uh, yeah, don't don't mince your words. Uh, what else? Uh, other reviews here. Playboy said McCartney substitutes fac uh, faculty for any real substance and compared it to watching someone juggle five guitars. Impressive, but you're wondering why it bothers. Uh, Robert Criscow in The Village Voice. It's a bad record, a classic form content mismatch, whatever that means. And McCartney uh, succumbed to conspicuous consumption by overworking himself and obscenely producing a style of music meant to be soft and whimsical again. What's he on about? Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's it's weird. Um, and then for, it it doesn't it, it isn't sort of reappraised. Uh, 1974, 75, NME say naive to have expected the McCartney to produce anything other than a mediocre record. Uh, grisly though this was, McCartney was to sink lower before rescuing his credibility in late 73. That was yeah, well, yeah, it's this notion run, so. that yeah, Band on the Run is the savior and it's not. Yeah, the, 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 I also find the Melody Maker review at the time, Chris Charlesworth, he said, um, you know, uh, it's a good album by anyone's standards, which is, you know, but certainly far better than the majority released by British groups and singers, i.e. at that year. Trouble is you expect too much from a man like McCartney. And I actually think that's the the rub is that you expect too much from McCartney. There's no expectation from George and George has delivered. Yeah. John is a bit of an unknown quantity and he's delivering the emotional punch. So I think Paul's problem is that he is batting against himself and how much people loved the Beatles and that love is being undermined by court cases and stories and wives and dynamite weed and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. And I, I, again, I think that point that you've made a few times about Paul's career is is best appreciated in retrospect. If you're sitting in 1971, waiting, you're, you're still waiting for the follow up to Abbey Road from yeah. Paul. You know, he's he, Abbey Road is a Paul album, uh, you know, despite George having the best songs on that album. But it, it, it's, it's a, um, you know, so people are still waiting for that follow up. Uh, McCartney hasn't been it. And then suddenly Ram isn't it, despite the fact you've got the orchestrations and all the rest of it. It's, it's kind of inconsistent. It's uh, and I sort of understand what Chris Guy is saying. He's saying, you know, you've 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 got whimsy mm. is what Paul Dawes, but actually in the middle of that, you've got Monkberry Moon Delight and Smile Away and, and what's going on there? These should be kind of, if you're going to do kind of whimsical nursery rhyme songs, then record them in an appropriate musical setting. Um, there were three, the other, yeah, sorry. No, I was just going to say, the other thing is 1971 is the kind of high watermark for music. So we can look back at it and we tend to see it in the context of imagine all things must pass Ringo's mm. you know it don't come easy but actually the record buying public are seeing it in the context of Bridge Over Troubled Water Who's Next Led Zeppelin 4 uh, Joni Mitchell's Blue Carol King's Tapestry Mudside yeah. Slim from, from James Taylor Hot Rats from Frank Zappa 1971 is a big year for albums and you know would you say is this a better album than Bridge Over Troubled Water uh uh, different, different album. Do you know what? I th I think maybe uh, at the time I'd have chosen Bridge. I certainly know what I'm listening to more now. I mean, there's a very yeah. larger discussion to be had about how the last 10 years of music listening and streaming and music on demand has tilted yeah. uh, in the favor of records that uh, have a more popular uh, drive to them. So you kind of see the change in popularity of groups like Queen and ELO and all those in the yeah. last 10 or 20 years because they are disconnected from the timbre of the times and you can kind of pull into them and just listen to them at whatever age you are if you're in the mood for that kind of thing. Um, whereas that's not the way the wind was blowing at the time. No. And we have we, we sort of have a vocabulary now to describe 
Ram, yes. you know, the, what, what, we, what was an indie record in 1971? Mm. You know, but not looking back, this is described as, you know, this is the first indie record. And you think, in a way, that's nonsense. It's Paul McCartney. It's the yeah. New York Philharmonic Orchestra. <laughs> One of those <laughs> records recorded in a massive studio with an orchestra. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's the, as you say, it's the same studio as, as Paul Simon, or Simon and Garfunkel recording The Boxer. This is, this is not in any sense an indie record, but it's regarded or, or talked about in those terms, but there wasn't that vocabulary um, at the time. You know, there were three people who could have given the album a good review that would have maybe tilted it in its favour, and that's John, George and Ringo. Um, but they didn't rate Ram at all. No, not at all. Uh, um uh, John John says at the time, I thought Ram was awful. McCartney was better because at least there were some tunes on it like junk. I liked the beginning of Ram on, the beginning of Uncle Albert, and I liked some of My Dog's Got Three Legs. I liked a little bit about Hands Across the Water, but it just tripped <laughs> off all the time. I didn't like that a bit. So, And of course, John apes the cover of Ram with the little postcard that comes in Imagine, in Imagine. which comes out uh, in September 71. Yeah, that's very funny. Um, so you know he's he's really he's really going for it uh, with with uh, w- with Imagine um, the post. But have you seen the postcard where somebody handed it to him in nineteen seventy four and asked him to autograph it? Yeah, what did he put on? Um, it? He just wrote, "It's just a pig." <laughs> you know, so it was like, okay, you know, we're kind of we're 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 past it. But this is this is the kind of uh, music to my ears. This is this is you know how do you sleep, which includes that. Yeah, that's all happening the only, at the same the time. The only thing you did was yesterday, and since you've gone, you're just another day, which supposedly that's an Alan Klein line, the mm. another day re- reference. Um, so, yeah, it, it you know, uh, uh, and Paul Paul talks about like that, uh, where he said, uh, you know, John did How Do You Sleep? I didn't want to get into a slanging match. Part of it was card as John was a great wit. And I didn't go want, didn't want to go fencing with the rapier champion <laughs> of East Cheam. Mm. Well, so. he, he he knew it wasn't worth it in the long run. Ringo also said, uh, <laughs> I think this is quite funny, I feel sad about Paul's albums. I don't think there's one good tune on the last one, Ram. He seems to be going strange. So even Ringo's getting the knife in. It, what he says is, yeah, I feel he's wasted his time, which I think, you know, everything you try to do, you know what, sure signs wasted from Back Off Boogaloo. The song he wrote about Paul. I know ah, you don't, I know you yes. don't believe that, but... Uh, well, yes. Well, Ringo's about to give a masterclass on how to waste time as the 70s roll on, but... No, we're doing... never going to get Ringo on the episode now. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, but there are some other releases related to Ram that we need to talk about. And the first one, as we said, he didn't do any active promotion, but there was one promotional uh, thing that he did do for Ram, which is a uh, a thing that's invariably called uh, Now Hear the Song of Mine, or also known as Brung to You By, which is this ad hoc studio it's... yeah thing. What is it? It's weird. It's absolutely weird. Uh, I think it's on, certainly there are bootlegs of it kicking around. Uh, it was a promotional album. I think 500 copies were pressed, sent out, sent out to radio stations. Um, and he, he basically, he recorded that song, Now I Hear This Song of Mine, uh, which is a little kind of vocal harmony piece. And then he handed everything over to uh, uh, Eric, the Norwegian, um, to, to chop it up. And it was supposed to be sent out to uh, radio stations. And uh, listening to it, you think, how how was it supposed to be used? Yeah, it doesn't make it, sense. It's, no, it's I just mean, its own thing. Yeah, what 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 you do is you record yourself answering questions, and then you send that record out so that the local DJ can ask the question, and it appears that you're answering it. But this is this is neither one thing or another. Um, and, and supposedly he said, Eric, I'll play you a couple of tunes on the piano and then Linda and I will sit down and answer some questions. And he said, I just mixed it up. And Paul said, yeah, that's great. And sent it out. It's yeah. a weird thing. I've never seen an original copy, um, but but you can track it down on YouTube. Uh, yes, it's all on YouTube. It goes for about 500 quid, which seems cheap for something that's only 500 limited, but there's a lot of fake copies out there. Um, a perfect opportunity to release it officially would have been in uh, one of the RAM reissues. I mean, it originally came out on CD in January 88, um, remastered in 93 with Another Day and a Woman, a Why put on. There's um, good old Steve Hoffman, 
from the Steve Hoffman forums, put out a digital compact classics edition in 1993, which are these super high mastered gold yeah. CDs, which if ever you see one languishing around in a bin, grab it. They are phenomenally expensive these days. Uh, is, that, they, is that likely to happen? Well, sometimes... Sometimes uh, they escape into the wild. Sometimes they do. And uh, I remember when those albums came out in the 90s and I just thought, what's the point? But actually, uh, <laughs> the gold Steve Hoffman uh, mastered RAM CD can go for about 300 quid if you see one. But uh, this, 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 this begs the question, why why was this not put in the archive edition? Oh, well, why, why, well, when, yes. why, why do we not have, there must be all of those basic takes from yeah. the New York sessions before they were overdubbed before, you know, we, we've talked about the Paul overdubbed all of the bass came later. So yeah. why are those things not uh, uh, on the archive release? I'm not buying it again. I'm telling you that. I mean, if there's a kind of archive part two version of RAM, yeah. Uh, I will. Readers, buy it again. Stephen's going to buy it again. Um, yeah. The archive edition of RAM did come out in 2012, and it goes to show the regard that uh, Paul holds the album in, because the archive started in 2010 with Mac with a band on the run. In 2011, McCartney one and McCartney two came out, and then in 2012, straight to RAM, giving us yeah. the impression that they were going to do things chronologically, but didn't. But the RAM box set is also the first of those kind of expanded McCartney archive box sets, where there's little envelopes and take pictures and flip books and all the rest. And what you do get is you get the album remastered, you get the bonus, some bonus tracks as well. You get the mono album, which was never released at the time. I've never really appreciated any particular difference in the mono album. No, uh, there is a, there is a version of the mono album that came out with the, a vinyl copy yes. that I, I picked up and I'm not wearing it today. My Ram t-shirt came with that. So. My goodness. And uh, but yeah, I'm a huge a, Paul fan. Everybody I know knows you are. that. It's a, but it would have been a perfect place, as you say, to put the uh, Brung to You by promotional disc, stick it in there as an extra CD. Yeah. Uh, and they didn't. Uh, and now uh, at the time of... Uh, uh, of, of 2021, there's a half speed remastered version coming uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary, which is yeah. another way to own your seventh copy of Ram I, or whatever. Yeah, well, I think I have that on order. But one of the other discs that came in the Ram box set is what we're going to talk about uh, now, which is Thrillington. And Thrillington is, uh, it's fantastic. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what you were going to say there. But well, it, no, I didn't hear Thrillington until the 2012 box set because it seemed to me like a silly idea. Uh, so Thrillington, for those of you who don't know, is an orchestral re-recording of Ram. And it seems like, well, how did it come to pass? Um, well, you were, you, you were saying, you know, Paul was wasting his time uh, on the farm <laughs> in, in 1971. Uh, this, this dates from June 71, so a month, a few weeks after Ram uh, ha has come out, uh, he he puts together effectively, it's not quite big band, it's not quite tea dance, it's so somewhere in between, but it's a kind of um, uh, something that would be on the BBC Light program mm. uh, of instrumental versions. Um, but it didn't actually come out until 1977. And then it doesn't come out as a Wings album or a Paul McCartney album. It comes out as a Percy Thrills Thrillington album. album. Yes. So, and the man behind it is Richard Hewson. Yes. Or yes. he's so the man Paul, behind the Paul, orchestrations. It, yes, we should say Paul does not play on this album. He does not sing on, on this album. And all of the arrangements were by... Uh, uh, Richard Hewson, who was actually asked before Ram came out uh, to work on the sessions. And um, uh, Paul is the producer. He's, he's there. He's kind of overseeing things, um, but he doesn't actually uh, appear on it. And, uh, you know, it came out in 1977, didn't exactly set the world or the charts alight. And Paul, of course, never admitted that it was anything to do with him. Until... Uh, uh uh, about 1989, wasn't it? And even yes. though his face is kind of on the back cover of the album in reflection style. So it's yes, it's, and it's on MPL. Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's I mean, the most I, lame uh, pseudonym ever. <laughs> that's, that's the word. That's the word I was not going to use, but I'll leave that up to you. Yeah, it's, it's weird. You kind of think, did you think this was hilariously funny or... Amusing. I mean, when it was when it came out in 1977, it's preceded by all these little ads yeah. that he puts in the press about Percy Thrill Thrilling Till will be appearing at such and such a thing, or he'd like you to know that this. And uh, you know, at the time, uh, you know, the press knew what this was. You yeah. know, nobody actually thought 
a, a character called Percy Thrills Thrillington had <laughs> stepped out of a PG Woodhouse novel and uh, released an album. You know, it was clearly. Um, but Richard Hewson is the guy. This is again interesting that he would go to Richard Hewson. Richard Hewson's the guy that did the string arrangements on uh, Let It Be. Yeah, for Phil Spector. So yeah. now Paul would have known him before because he he was in the. Um, wasn't he in Peter Asher's kind of orbit, playing making music with Peter Asher, and he'd orchestrated Mary Hopkins. So Paul would have worked with them yes, and seen his yes. work before. Yeah. But yes, he is the guy who does the orchestrations on the long and winding road that led to so much hassle as part of the, the dissolution of the Beatles. Yeah, and you think, you know, Paul can barely bring himself to speak Phil Spector's name and sort of famously walked out of a Q Awards ceremony when they, they, they announced the Lifetime Achievement Award for Phil Spector. But he's quite happy to work with the guy that actually did the uh, the arrangements. But yeah, it's, it's these, you know, these aren't coincidences. These are the connections. So he's in a band with uh, uh, Peter Asher. Uh, Paul is producing uh, These Were the Days. So those were the days for, for Mary Hopkins. He comes in, does the string arrangement. Um, uh, there he does the string arrangements on James Taylor's uh, record uh, for Apple. Yeah, it does doesn't it does raise the question of did Paul know that Richard Houston did the uh, did did the orchestrations at all? Because he says Richard Houston says in interviews, Paul's never said anything about it, so no. we don't know. Maybe just Paul doesn't know that he's gone off and done that. But um, yeah. he did go on to do the orchestration for My Love. Yes, yes. Um, so I say it's 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 just a long the long working connection uh, uh, there. Yeah. So, but if you haven't heard uh, Thrillington, it's great because what Thrillington does is it reveals to you all the layers of the thing that McCartney does well, all these little interpolated melodies, all the stuff that's going on in the background, the orchestral versions pull all these individual melodies out and you can hear the songs in a totally different way and then go back to the original album and enjoy that. This is this is this is what you say. You know, Paul thinks in in terms of uh, arrangements. You know, he has all of that in his head. And yeah, this is this is exactly the way to uh, sort of deconstruct it um, and, and and listen to it again. Can we can we mention Twin Freaks at well, this point? Speaking of deconstruction, that's that's the 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 other way of deconstructing it. So because Twin Freaks uh, features Long Haired Lady and Oh Woman Oh Why, and Twin Freaks is another one of these McCartney pseudonymous um crazy ideas writ large yeah it's a kind of uh, a farman style thing where he he it's a collaboration with someone called uh, roy care you may know him better as uh, free <laughs> freelance hellraiser uh, oh, suppose, that's his name uh, that's his name um so this is this is actually a double album uh of of remixes where uh, this guy just completely deconstructs the original tapes um and he was originally employed to do a sort of pre-show mixtape uh for a 2004 mm. concert tour um and Paul liked it so they they just started kind of doing remixes it is great i'm not sure it's ever had a cd Release. It's available, I think, on streaming services. If you can it pick is up on a, streaming vinyl, services. a vinyl copy, is 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 hard to find, but it's really good. Uh, I particularly like uh, this. Maybe I'm amazed. There's a great deconstruction of that, but Long Haired Lady is uh, a great track on there. It, it, it is fantastic. Yeah, Twin Freaks. It is on your streaming services, uh, which is maybe the best way to just put it on because it's you know it deconstructs all these Paul songs and mashes them up again, and uh, it's it's a lot of fun trying to play spot the spot the riff yep. and all that kind of stuff. It's it's, it's very very good. Um, but obviously, all of this is about Ram itself. I don't know exactly where the the reappraisal of Ram as being absolutely absolutely fantastic <laughs> happened. It seemed to happen. My, my memory is that, you know, even in the late 80s, early 90s, it still was rated as a lower tier McCartney album. Yes. It seems to be a, very much a 21st century phenomenon that, uh, that, that it has come back to life. And I can't really point towards, you know, the way with things like McCartney too, you can say, well, hot chip, they're, they're, they're yes, the people yes, who, who yes. kind of gave it a bit of a nudge. Um, I can't really point towards any particular event that uh, where we seem to have a collective consciousness that said, actually, Ram's really rather good. Yeah, it seems to be, it's, I say, I, I, I think it's the fact that suddenly the vocabulary emerged in, yeah. in, in terms of sort of, you, you know, uh, there's indie albums and, and there's that general kind of sense of things made at home, you know, mm. people uh, do, even though, it, and that's the irony, it doesn't, it, it wasn't made that way. Yeah. Um, it's just presented that way. Um, McCartney, the first album is, is much more of that uh, uh, style of recording, but it doesn't fit. And mm. the, the, it's, I always think of this as having quite an American 
sound as well. You know, I think that I think the fact that it was made in New York is is apparent. You know, I think mm. um, you know maybe not on tracks like Heart of the Country, but I I I think there is a kind of sound to it. It's quite distinctive. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I think it's probably a 21st century. Uh, there, there was, yeah, there's definitely a tilt in how McCartney and all his work was perceived, I believe, after 98 when Linda McCartney passed yeah. away. Yes. And that I think people became a lot more conciliatory to try and understand what had happened between the two of them uh, over those years. Yes. And, uh, you know, I think that's part of the process that got us to where we are today. Um, yes, it's that vocal blend. And there's undoubtedly that the, there's been a complete uh, repositioning of Linda in the uh, in, in the sort of in the mix, in the story and her role and a greater appreciation of her role. And I think also Flaming Pie plays into that as well. So, you know, the last track on Flaming Pie is Great yeah. Day. And that is a song which exactly has a line that goes straight back to very early Paul and Linda in the early 70s. It's written at that time, was originally recorded at that time. It has the Linda harmonies. And if all that stuff that was happening in the late 90s um, between Flaming Pie and the reappraisal of Paul and the Beatles and what Linda was going through at that time, I think people really were able to feel it all again and understand what it meant. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I think that's right. But what do you think, everybody? Uh, Ram, it's obviously one of your favourites, um, you know, we just want to send you back and listen to the records. That's always our mantra here. Um, you know, do you like Ram? Did you do? Were you there in 1971? What was your opinion at the time? Let us know. Get involved in all the usual places on Twitter at Beatles Pod, the Nothing Is Real Facebook group, the Nothing Is Real website, nothingisrealpod.com, which has links to all sorts of stuff. At the YouTube channel, like and subscribe, uh, where we've got playlists for episodes. So for an episode like today, we're going to put in all the clips of Brung to You by the, the Ram clips, all that kind of stuff. You can uh, look at all that stuff in, uh, after having a, a good old listen to the podcast here. Uh, and, um, you know, if you want to get involved on ACAST Plus, there's ways you can donate and support the podcast. We are appreciating all of those things. Um, and it's all uh, accessible through nothingisrealpod.com. Uh, but I think I'll go off and listen to Ram, Stephen. What about you? Yes, I think I'll go and listen to uh, Thrillington. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, but for now, I'm Jason Carty. I'm Stephen Cockcroft. And this has been Nothing Is Real. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.